Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, tax deduction limits that could hit New Jersey hard. The cap on property tax deductions in New Jersey. What impact is that having on homeowners and businesses? And what effect could it have on the election? With the big chill approaching, the state announces a plan to help those of lesser means stay warm this winter. A major South Jersey electricity company is launching a $6.5 million program to educate and train people for jobs of the future. Plus, New Jersey leads the nation in home floor foreclosures. We'll drill down on one cause and some possible cures. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. And again, please forgive the bandage, the result of necessary but not serious surgery. We begin with taxes. Unless a legal workaround is devised, that limit on the amount of state and local taxes you can deduct on federal tax forms could cost homeowners here a bundle. We asked senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan to find out where the SALT deduction stands. Few issues animate a neighborhood chat in New Jersey like high property taxes. Consistently, it's among the top three issues of concern for voters here. And in affluent Bergen County, where homeowners pay almost $25,000 on average in annual property taxes, the new $10,000 federal cap on state and local tax, or SALT deductions, has already slowed home sales, according to builders and realtors. I think it's really diminished the demand for property. I think people are rethinking the choices they're making in regards to upgrading their houses. It's an impact, I think, on people moving into this area, mm -hmm. you know, where we have already high taxes. It starts to look unreasonable, and New Jersey is taxed on every end, and we need to get more federal dollars back. Gutting salt amounts to a 7% tax increase on many of the residents in my district, in the 5th Congressional District in northern New Jersey. According to Moody's, it's going to slow growth and decrease property values in New Jersey by 10 percent. Incumbent Congressman Josh Gottheimer and his New Jersey colleagues, except for Tom MacArthur, all oppose the SALT cap and they support a workaround Gottheimer helped devise, sort of an end run. It had let Jersey homeowners donate up to 90 percent of their property tax bill as a charitable contribution in return for tax credits. But the IRS threw a flag on that play in August. It's proposed new rules to limit those tax credits to just 15 percent. Standing on the lawn of a million dollar home, Gottheimer announced he sent the IRS a letter of complaint. This is just a cynical attempt by the IRS to deliver on their own political ends to build on sticking it to the Northeast like others have. But damage done. Even though Governor Murphy signed a law authorizing the cap work around the state warrant, it makes no representations with respect to how the IRS will treat property tax creditable contributions to a charitable fund. In other words, your mileage may vary. Proceed at your own risk. Towns put the work around on hold. We really don't want to set it up to have the IRS come back to us and say that this won't be available to our residents as it's a pretty large cost to the township. So we're kind of taking a wait and see attitude. New Jersey joined several other states in a lawsuit seeking to overturn the cap. Attorney General Gerber Graywalls threatened to sue the IRS if it adopts the new rules limiting credits for charitable deductions. There's a lot at stake. The IRS reports Jersey homeowners on average take $18,000 in SALT deductions, and a $10,000 cap leaves a big bill. For my first-time home buyers, for my seniors who want to stay in their homes, this deduction was crucial for us, so it's very important that we get it back. The IRS will hold a public hearing on its proposal to quash the SALT cap workaround. It's scheduled for November 5th, the day before elections, in case voters need a reminder. In Ridgewood, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
Tomorrow evening, we resume our weekly Wednesday night debates ahead of the midterm elections. Democratic Senator Bob Menendez and his Republican challenger Bob Hugan face off right here. And you can join the debate on air or online starting at 8. The Murphy administration is trying to break down the silos that separate departments, encouraging them to work together to solve problems in the state. A case in point is heating assistance from two agencies for those least able to afford it, with an eye to doubling efficiency while using less energy. Senior correspondent David Cruz has this advance on peril and promise the challenge of climate change. Let's face it, summer is gone. And while temps today were moderate, it won't be long before winter grips the state. And for people of lesser means, the prospect is more fraught than most, because girding against the season from inside an old house takes resources they don't always have. While the state has provided weatherization services through a number of programs across several departments, today the lieutenant governor came to Tom's River to announce that her department, Community Affairs, and the Board of Public Utilities would consolidate their weather assistance program and the Comfort Partners program at BPU. Just think about the number of people all across this state who don't have the ability to afford heating during the winter. We have older residents who, through the years, we've been able to provide with oil. Uh, we've been able to help with uh, New Jersey shares, but nothing gets to be uh, more important in the long term than helping people weatherize their homes to reduce down the cost. And now, with the two departments formally merging their weatherization assistance programs, they'll be able to double the effectiveness and efficiencies of providing the services, which in some cases are life saving. We find gas leaks in customers' homes, insulation that's not there, open sewers, plumbing leaks, broken windows missing gutters, the list goes on and on. This is also partly about the administration's efforts to get departments to work together where possible. Oliver said she hopes that the legislature will see fit to increase funding for the programs once they see how much bang for buck they can deliver. BPU President Joe Fiordaliso put it in a broader context. We have, as a society, a moral obligation to ensure the fact that we do everything humanly possible to mitigate the effects of climate change. We're not joking here. As far as I know, unless you know differently, this is the only piece of real estate we can live on. Saving the planet may be a lot to ask for from a weatherization program, but every bit helps. And a buttoned up home means warmer residents using less energy and paying less for it leaving some leftover for things like rent, food, and clothing. Even climate change skeptics can get behind that, right? In Tom's River, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Home foreclosures top tonight's business news. With details on that and more, here's Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, New Jersey continues to lead the nation in the number of foreclosed homes, and the problem is particularly bad in South Jersey, led by Atlantic County, where one out of every 395 homes was in foreclosure as of this past May. The Walter Rand Institute for Public Affairs at Rutgers University, Camden, has issued a report with a series of recommendations on how to fix this problem. The report suggests the legislature and private sector work to create a revolving loan fund for buying foreclosed homes and turning them into affordable housing. The report also calls on the state to address that one issue everyone continues to talk about, and that's high property taxes. Governor Murphy's overseas journey took him to East Jerusalem today, where he met with several Palestinian business leaders. According to ROI, he met with company representatives from the technology, life sciences and retail sectors. While in Israel, the governor also participated in a roundtable on the autonomous vehicle industry. With an eye towards strengthening its international pipeline, New Brunswick-based Johnson & Johnson is seeking to buy a Japanese skincare company. J&J &J will pay about $2 billion in cash for CIZ Holdings. It already holds a small stake in that company. 
The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says New Jersey residents will have an opportunity to comment on the proposed license transfer application for the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant. That's according to the press of Atlantic City. Camden-based Holtec is seeking to buy the now shuttered plant from Exelon. Residents have until November 8th to formally request a hearing on the license transfer. The plant went offline permanently last month. Holtec wants to buy it and decommission it. In the past week, there has been no less than a dozen nationwide recalls of pre-made food and meat products and ready-to-eat salads at retailers that include Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, 7-Eleven, and Walmart. All of the products are being recalled due to the potential risk of listeria and salmonella contamination, but there have been no reports of those illnesses. On Wall Street, stocks retreating today. The Dow fell 126 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. A severe viral outbreak inside a rehabilitation center has left six children dead and sickened a dozen more. Health officials say an adenovirus usually causes mild illness, but this strain at the Wanakew Center for Nursing and Rehabilitation infected medically fragile kids with already compromised immune systems. Governor Murphy says the health department is taking vital measures to prevent the spread of the virus. Meantime, the center will not be allowed to admit new patients until the outbreak's over. The seven alarm fire that incinerated five buildings in Dover's downtown business district was fueled by a natural gas line. The mayor says it took a while for the power company, New Jersey Natural Gas, to locate the shutoff, leaving the inferno to burn for more than five hours, destroying six businesses and 14 apartments, leaving 40 people permanently displaced and 40 more living in temporary housing. Governor Murphy's goal of replacing fossil fuels with 100 percent clean energy by the year 2050 will take a new kind of workforce trained to power the grid with new sustainable technologies. And that new workforce is already on the way. Raven Santana reports. Atlantic City Electric wants to make sure students are ready for careers of the future, and they're investing millions of dollars to do so. This is not just about creating jobs in southern New Jersey. It's about creating careers for people. We have an aging workforce that's continuing to retire. So it's programs like this that we need to help train the next generation to be able to fill those jobs and be able to help create the grid of tomorrow. The electric company is funding a six-year, $6.5 million initiative for a workforce development program. It's being implemented through a partnership with three South Jersey Votech schools, including the Atlantic County Institute of Technology, where the initiative was launched. The program focuses on educating and training students for future clean energy jobs, and it starts in interactive electrical classrooms like these. So they learn for residential, commercial, and industrial. And now this great opportunity with Atlantic City Electric because we're actually going to be able to go to their site, their training facility, and see what they do. Susan Helsel is a union electrician during the summer but works as an electrical instructor here at the Votech during the school year. She says technology and clean energy are making a difference in her classes. The curriculum is definitely changing. Um, just with LED lighting and the low voltage cable, uh, instead of hooking them up, you're plugging things in. The alternative energy is um, a must right now. The initiative is made up of four programs. Get into math and boot camp, women in sustainable employment pathway, Atlantic City Electric Line School, and High School Energy Career Academy. So we deal with those that are 18 and up and we try to give them the skills that they need to meet the uh, demands of our local employers. The launch comes just months after Governor Phil Murphy signed a law into legislation to advance New Jersey's clean energy economy and create more clean energy technologies like solar and wind. You know, trying to create offshore wind not too far from here, 
right? And then you have a, a solar energy that is you are trying to bring into the, into the communities. All those programs are coming, and these youngsters who are going to be uh, w walking into a, a tr tremendously automated field and distributed generation, it's going to be exciting. The workforce program is free of charge and available to high school students and anyone 21 and under in six South Jersey counties. Classes are set to start in January 2019. In Mays Landing, Raven Santana, NJTV News. The state Senate's advanced a bill to jumpstart deployment of electric vehicles. A test drive tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Atlantic City, where staging at the old Baderfield runway starting line were Assemblyman Vince Mazio in a Tesla Model 3 and Mayor Frank Gilliam in a Chevy Volt. The Tesla was faster, 0 to 60 in 3.3 electric seconds, while the Chevy Volt took about 7 seconds to hit 60. Beyond the exhilaration of G-forces, Environment New Jersey's executive director says the Ride and Drive event was meant to persuade elected officials to convert some or all public fleets to electric for cleaner air, better mileage, and no engine to tune up. Next to Trenton, where no tune-ups were necessary, at the Halloween edition of the 2018 Trenton Punk Rock Flea Market, more than 200 vendors, 10 food trucks, and costume creatures in frightening finery transformed the Roebling Wireworks factory into a feast for the eyes, with live music and tattooing that had lines of participants snaking around the block. Finally, Jersey City, where a collection of superheroes made Leonard Gordon Park arguably the safest place in town. Wonder Woman made an appearance at the Halloween bash, a Batman or two, and Spider-Man too got a jump on the holiday, plus a Lego and some princesses, all of whom got to check out a pumpkin patch, a maze, and face painting, which did not make them cuter than they already were. And that's the Garden State Express for Tuesday, October 23rd. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. In 1967, a Life magazine expose of organized crime put New Jersey's fabled mobsters on the map, like Richie the Boot Boyardo, so named for the tavern phone boot he frequented. The story shocked the nation and led the state to establish a special commission that would investigate misconduct or malfeasance on the part of organized crime or public officials. Now, half a century later, the New Jersey State Commission of Investigation's current executive director, Lee Seglum, joins Brianna Venosi. So it's the 1960s. There's all kinds of social unrest. Life magazine comes out with this expose about organized crime. Lo and behold, New Jersey's in the middle of it. And what happens then? Well, people were shocked because some of the revelations in that Life magazine series were just appalling. For example, they had stories about Richie the Boot Boyardo, who was a Genovese capo at the time. He had a 29-acre compound estate in Livingston, property that was occupied in part by an incinerator that reputedly was used for more than just burning trash. Mm, we can read between the lines there. Right. And this guy, Sam the Plumber de Cavalcanti, who became the boss of the only really homegrown organized crime uh, family in New Jersey, he reportedly, according to Life at the time, was working on the development of a large garbage disposal that was, that they described as something that would be able to turn a human being into a meatball. Ooh. So people were shocked. And so what, what was going to be done about this? The legislature, of course, appointed a committee, which is the natural thing they do, but they got serious about this. So they created the State Division of Criminal Justice, which is an agency in the Attorney General's office that really does the prosecutions and arrests and criminal activity investigations. But then somebody asked the question, well, why wait until there's a crime committed before you start an investigation? Why not look at systems that are vulnerable to criminal abuse or activity or unscrupulous uh, behavior like that and do an investigation of those systemic flaws? And that's where the SCI comes in. The backdrop for you all. So it wasn't just about uh, being another type of prosecutor or arresting. You exactly. really look into systemic wide issues. So I have this um, taxpayer dollars 
that were saved from investigations that the commission conducted. $17 million in uh, ripoffs within health benefits, yep. $3.5 million in savings from unused sick leave that you all discovered, $39 million in wasteful and excessive cash benefit payout. Has the cr type of crime you all have investigated over the last 50 years changed all that much? Well, it's gotten a little bit more sophisticated with the advent of higher technology and computers and that sort of thing. But, but basically, at its heart, it's still people trying to rip off the system and for their own personal gain. On the organized crime front, you know, the mafia has kind of diminished. They're sort of like a low-grade fever on the criminal front these days. But they've been superseded by these very volatile, violent criminal street gangs and drug-dealing syndicates. We just had a public hearing a couple of weeks ago where we took a look at the emerging real serious problem with juvenile gun violence and neighborhood gangs. So, yeah, it's constantly changing, and it constantly needs some, some agency like the SCI to, to monitor it and, and, and keep people informed. How does an investigation land on your desk, so to speak? Uh, a lot of the investigations we do are generated in-house by our expert professional investigators, accountants, and analysts. Uh, occasionally, legislators or public officials will say, we got a problem here, you need to look at this. The governor's office as uh, well, I'd from, imagine. From time to time, that's correct. And even average citizens, we have a complaint hotline that can people file complaints on. Uh, this led to a whole series of investigations 12 or 15 years ago into abuses and corruption in new home construction and inspections. Mm -hmm. We had three or four public hearings. Those people went to all kinds of agencies looking for help and some assistance. They went to criminal justice agencies. It wasn't for them. To, and they finally wound up on our doorstep, and we were able to help them. I have a list here. I mean, it's you've, you've got so many. But one of the more recent ones, uh, investigations you all did, was into New Jersey's SPCAs, the Societies for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, there was an investigation, widespread investigation, you all did about the opioid epidemic, about the filtering right. of these prescription drugs. I mean, I have lists upon lists of what you all have looked into. Um, the corruption within recycling is one. Um, firearms and and access to ammunition. What sticks out in your mind as maybe one of the more prominent investigations you all have done? Because policy comes of this, yes? Exactly. Well, I think the, the work we did on the, um, the opioid and heroin epidemic was really landmark investigative work. We were really ringing the klaxon and waving the red flag about this almost 10 years ago before almost any other government agency yeah. about this horrible tragedy that was coming over the horizon. So I think that was probably one of our most significant investigations in the modern era. The one you just mentioned about the SPCA, that was a, a project. We decided three or two or three years ago to start following up on past investigations we had done, because in some cases, nothing was done in response to them. The first SPCA investigation we did was almost two decades ago. So we said, let's take a look at this. This organization is still in place. There had already been a little bit of media reporting about continuing abuses, financial and otherwise. And sure enough, when we got into it, it was a mess. So this time, we presented that to the legislature. They, pre they prepared legislation and basically abolished that organization and transferred the responsibility for the important job of enforcing the animal cruelty laws to qualified law enforcement. Yeah, it was a big deal. So your statue, a, a while back, legislators made the commission permanent, but nothing in New Jersey is permanent. You're at the whims of... The, the budget cycle and the legislative and executive branches. I mean, are, are, you, are you comfortable to say that we'll see the commission go on for another 50 years from I, there? I think so, but I think the, the SCI needs to continue doing good, hard-hitting work. It's all about how, how many products you can put out in the street. You know, life in Trenton is what have you done for us lately? And that's a legitimate question to ask. And as I said, I think every government agency has a responsibility to follow up on the impact results of, of the work they've done, and that's why we're doing that at the SCI. Lee Seglum, Executive Director for the New Jersey State Commission of Investigation. We hope to continue watching the reports you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Now, some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. The average Bergen County homeowner pays almost $25,000 in annual property taxes. Atlantic City Electric serves 547,000 customers in South Jersey. 
The Solar Energy Industries Association says there are 417 solar companies in New Jersey, and the State Commission of Investigation was created in 1968 to counter the growing problem of organized crime and political corruption. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Late word, Speaker Coughlin has announced Attorney Joseph A. Hayden Jr. will serve as co-counsel to the Joint Committee investigating government hiring practices and the criminal justice system's procedures for responding to allegations of sexual assault. Tomorrow on NJTV News, VR lets students explore the world without leaving the classroom. And tomorrow evening, Democratic Senator Bob Menendez and his Republican challenger Bob Hugan square off right here in the next of our weekly debates ahead of the midterm elections. You can join the debate on air or online starting at 8 o'clock. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Lead funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagalos and Diana T. Vagalos. Major support is provided by the Mark Haas Foundation and Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III. Have some water. So Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.